Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our graduate seminar in neurophilosophy. We are very happy to announce today we have uh, Guilherme Camargo giving his talk on AI in creativity. Guilherme, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, can you hear me? Is, is my sound okay? Okay, I, I can't see you as always. Uh, let me tell you that I, I cannot see you. So if you have uh, any questions, any comments while I'm presenting, you're welcome to interrupt me, but uh, via the microphone, because I cannot see the, uh, sometimes I, I switch here to the, uh, the uh, multiple screen, but not always, so I can't see you. Okay, so I'm gonna, talk a little bit about AI and creativity. Um, I've been uh, reading things on this uh, subject uh, recently, but I far from being uh, an expert. Although I've seen that the amount of material available on AI and creativity is much lower than, for example, ethics and AI. Uh, it, it, it's a less explored subject. So we can expect also, um, so I'm gonna go over uh, not in depth uh, on some subjects, but also I think there's a lot of to be, to be explored still in this subject. So let me start here with this uh, painting. Uh, it was a first color image created by Aaron. It's on the computer museum in Boston, but uh, the artist slash programmer who, uh, worked on, on the Arrow development was Harold Cohen. He, he died a couple of years ago. And Aaron Z is, is a, a robotic system developed over many years by, by Harold Cohen that can pick up a paintbrush with its robotic arm and paint on canvas. So it's not only a, a software that generates images, but it's also a, 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 uh, a robot that can, can do physical paintings. Uh, it draws, so it draws people in a botanic garden, not just making a copy of an existing drawing, but generating as many as unique drawings on this theme as may be required of it. Aaron has never seen a person or walked through a botanical garden, but has given knowledge about body postures, about uh, plants and by, by its program. how we can move here this screen because it's not going. This seems always happens, right? Some you know, the first screen it stops. Okay. You can see the second screen, right? Yep. Okay. So um this is a, a piece of the politics by Aristotle. So uh, it on the 1253b, it says, let us begin by this, this is Aristotle, okay? Let us begin by discussing the relation of master and slaves. And every assistant is, as it were, a tool that serves for several tools. For if every tool could perform its own work when ordered or by seeing what to do in advance, like the statues of Daedalus in the story, or the tripods of Hephaestus, which the poet says, enter self moved the company divine. If thus shuttles, woven quills, played harps of themselves, master craftsmen would have no need of assistance and masters no need of slaves. So here we have uh, Aristotle, uh, talking a little bit about uh, statues. So uh, of course the, the idea of robots would uh, not be, be no, non-existing at his time, but uh, statues that would self move themselves and um, equipments that would uh, self play themselves. Uh, and this would be an assistance to, to man. So we can see that this um, idea of machines and mechanization, uh, is, is something that's been going on for a while in the human species. There is a discussion uh, actually by the Sapiens book uh, that 
technology uh, itself is one of the things that define man. Uh, man is, uh, the, the human being is a human being because it uses technology or is able to create technology. Uh, so it would be intrinsic to our existence, the, 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 um, the creation of tools to help ourselves. Let me just talk a little bit how I got into this um, uh, research on AI and, and creation. My research specifically is on uh, the robot judge. So would be the algorithms being able to uh, perform analysis of uh, judicial processes, and they are able to issue uh, decisions. So on my, on my research, I was always curious about the argument that uh, is presented not only on the, on the uh, judicial side, but on other professions. When people argue that some tasks can never be um, transferred to machines. Uh, the argument that, oh no, only humans can do that because of some essential, um, some, some essential characteristic that's presented in humans and cannot be replicated on machines is sometimes used as an argument for other, uh, for, for someone who is defending the fact that only humans can perform certain types of activities uh, in, in terms of uh, intrinsic characteristic that cannot be replicated. So what, uh, so how I got into this creativity? Uh, one of the things, of course, that, uh, let's say a couple of decades ago, people were saying is that, oh, okay, a computer can do math, a computer can do uh, many activities, but there are some activities like, for example, poetry and music composing and, and art that can never be uh, transferred to machines. And we're starting to challenge uh, that, uh, that argument because uh, we've seen, we've are now seeing some, not only music and art and some other things, but uh, a general broad group of cognitive activities that we thought uh, were specific, human specific that are not being transferred to machines. So in my research, when I was looking at, uh, on how would a computer be able to issue a dis uh, judiciary decision, I was uh, getting in touch with this. Uh, so there's a creativity part. Is there a creativity part actually in a, in a, in a judiciary decision that we have to, to look at in terms of uh, non, non delegatable to a machine or there isn't. And I was not only interested on, on specifically how a machine can do the job, but I was interested on the argument on the, on the, on the speech saying, oh, uh, this will never be deployable. This will never be a transfer to a machine. Because I wanted to understand where, where it's coming from and how it's built uh, for us to, uh, to be able to confront that with some other, with, with the things that computers are, are doing now. So that's just a, a, a background and a, a contextualization of my research. So let's start here. Hold on just a second, I'm always moving things here. Um, with some cunt. Let me just get here. Okay, so Kant says on the critique of power of judgment, uh, what, we're, what are we searching here? Is creativity a method? So if yes, does it have steps? It, or is creativity a process? So it can be described. Can it be described? The problem seems not to produce something new. AI can do faster all those options, but to recognize the good output. So let me go back here a little bit on the on the cut where he's saying. So this is cut now. Since learning is nothing but imitation, this is cut saying. Even the greatest aptitude for learning, facility for learning, capacity as such, still does not count as genius. But even if one thinks or writes for himself and does not merely take up what others have thought, 
indeed, even if he invents a great deal for art and science, this is still not a proper reason for calling such a great mind a genius, since just this sort of thing could also have been learned and thus still lies on the natural path of inquiry and reflection in accordance with rules. And it's not specifically distinct from what which on that which can be acquired by means of imitation. So what is Kant saying here? Kant saying that from, from this line, from, from this line of thought, uh, we can say that a scientist like Newton, although possessing a great mind, is not a genius. By contrast, uh, although based on some fundamental skills, uh, it falls under determinant rules. So it cannot be imitated taught or learned. So art cannot be taught or learned. Science is discovery, is rational. It can be taught, it can be learned. So here we see that Kant has a very, very specific understanding of uh, what creation is. So creation is something, it's more linked to the mysterious side of the, of the process than to the rational side. Uh, Kant is arguing, which is basically uh, the same line of uh, reasoning that we have today, that there's something about creativity that is uh, obscure and, and not um, forecastable. And, and science is method. So this is it's almost like you can say that this is discovery can be forecasted. So I, I know that in, in couple of years, other things will be invented and then it's going to progress like that science. But art, no, art is very, is very, um, uh, it's very strange. It's very obscure. You, you cannot forecast where it's going. It's, uh, it's interesting because this is on the background of what we think about this uh, uh, human, human only activity versus what is, could be delegated to computers. Uh, we see this line of uh, reasoning from Kant still. So what I'm saying here is that the, if Kant equals Plato when saying that the creative individual is a conduit for some kind of uncontrollable force coming from somewhere else. Uh, so uh, according to Kant, creativity is a priori and transcendental. Uh, that definition raises the problem, which it cannot be taught. Um, so um, here, let's keep that in mind. I'm going to go back to this. Uh, it can be taught. It cannot be taught. But I just, I'm just locating here an origin of the of the discussion in Kant. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, let me. Talk a little bit about the uh, another point that is uh, is triggering my research is the alphabet. In the process of creating uh, alphabets on the language development in humanity, um, the first alphabets, for, uh, like definition, for example, you have only consonants, right? You don't have vowels. Uh, some, I, I think, there are some alphabets still today that uh, keep that. The, some ways of writing that keep that uh, characteristic, which is when you read something, you need to be able to know what you're reading in order to insert the vowels in the sentence and complete the, the, the phoneme. Uh, so what happens? When the Greek alphabet was created, you don't uh, you have vowel sounds. And then for the first time, you don't need to understand anymore what you are reading in order to read it. You can pronounce whatever is written for someone who understands what you're saying, but you don't you yourself don't need to be understanding what you're reading in order to produce the sound that represents, the ideas there are written there, which is different from the, the other alphabet where you have to insert, you have to understand what you're reading in order to insert the vowels and make the right uh, sound. If not, you make the wrong sound. Um, what is the point here? The point is that uh, 
here with the grid alphabet, we separate syntax and semantics. Uh, you, you can work specifically on syntax and leave semantics aside because you don't need to be understanding anymore what you're saying in order to produce some things. And that's, uh, uh, I'm just going to the chat here. Yeah, Hebrew doesn't have vowels either. Yeah, that's what I, I know that the, um, there were some languages that kept that today. Um, sometimes I'll go to the chat, sometimes well, it will take me some time, okay. So what I'm saying here is that when we remember the um, example that uh, Cheryl gives us on the Chinese room, where uh, syntax and semantics is, uh, are, are separate, we understand that, that uh, in the history of uh, writing, there was the origin is on those languages that were able to produce the entire sound without uh, the reader being able to to understand what he's saying, which takes us to let me see now the infinite monkey theorem. I already have presented that before here. I love the infinite monkey theorem, uh, but let me just explain uh, where we are. So the infinite monk theorem is basically that I'll, I'll try to simplify, which oh. says, uh, I think there, did someone call me here? Oh no, it's a Paulo Lustosa's microphone is open. Um, the infinite monkey theorem says, if you put a monkey uh, typing a typewriter to the infinite, eventually he's gonna produce Shakespeare. Uh, why? Because you type randomly and to the infinite randomly, you can get anything because all, all, the, all the works produced to the infinite but will, will show up because it's uh, infinite time. So just here, and this theorem has been proven, for example, consider the, this is the, for the word banana, okay? So consider the probability of typing the word banana on the typewriter with 50 keys. So that's why the number 50 is there. Suppose that the keys are pressed randomly and independently, meaning that each key has an equal chance of being pressed regardless of what keys have been pressed previously. The chance that the first letter typed is B is one over 50. The chance that the second type letter is A is also one over 50 and so on. So therefore the probability will be on this equation. This equation has a 50 there on top of the monkey on the figure there because it uh, represents 50, um, to, to the, 50 to the to the six because banana has six letters. Uh, but you can apply that to to any any word. Uh, so from the above, the, 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 the theorem shows, so the proof is the opposite, right? The chance of not typing banana on a given block is one minus one over 50 to the sixth uh, times to the end. Why? What we're saying here is that the probability is very little, but it's not zero. So since you have, yeah, and, and the probability for producing anything is very, very, very little, but it's not zero. And since we're working with infinity, the monkey typing randomly keys will produce uh, eventually anything, even Shakespearean poetry, because he has an infinite time to produce all those things. And um, so I'm gonna start putting some examples of art and AI. Uh, this is a site called botpoet.com. It, it is a poet that is an AI and, that, uh, and produces poetry. So this is one of the poetry you are inscribed in the lines on the ceiling you are inscribed in the depths of this store. Uh, and of course, today, the, the process to write poetry on machine learning is not just random words. Uh, it, it's machine learning. It's like you give a uh, program or an algorithm uh, some examples of something you want. It understands some connections some word connections, some uh, relations, and then it produces something uh, close to what you're, you're feeding it. It's not random like the infinite monkey theorem. Uh, so it's, it's faster, 
uh, otherwise we would have an output of a lot of random words together until we got something that would make sense. And this is this is a poetry that uh, makes some sense uh, much more than it would be uh, some random random sentences. And there's also on Twitter poem dot uh, e, x e, which is uh, it's a haiku type of poetry. So it tweets sometimes if you want to <laughs> follow it. Uh, Asleep at noon on a bare twig among cherry blossoms shadows. Uh, so it's a it is some uh, also some poetry that is uh, produced by by AI. So let's go back a little bit to Lady Lovelace. Uh, when she um, used to say that the analytical engine has no pretensions whatsoever to originate anything. It can do only whatever we know how to order it to perform. Uh, this is, uh, um, it's very similar to, uh, to uh, an idea that we need to be able to teach the uh, computer uh, what to do. But before machine learning, of course, we were, also, we were always thinking in terms of algorithms. So we would have to teach the, the robot poet in, uh, which words to combine. Yeah. Instead, now with machine learning, uh, the, the computer itself is learning how to put the words together. So today we order create. Um, what we can say is that this uh, idea that comes from Lady Lovelace in terms of the basic algorithm is already overcome because uh, we don't need to teach the computer anymore uh, how to do the task. We just need to give him what we want as an example, and then it will figure out its way to, to get to, to what we want, uh, being that uh, poetry, music, art, and any other thing that we call uh, creations. Uh, so the, the um, Lovelace's uh, book was analyzed by Margaret Bolden, and she created uh, for her book the uh, what she called the uh, Lovelace questions. So the uh, questions are: Can computational ideas help us to understand human creativity? And that's the main focus of uh, her study. Uh, she says yes, it's yes to the first question. Uh, the second one is, can computers at least appear to be creative? And I think that's a very interesting discussion because uh, what we are looking for here at the end is not uh, something that will humanize the algorithms. Uh, and make them have all the properties that the human does in order for us to be able to call them creative. Uh, but, but also this appearance of being creative, we all, uh, we, we, we are gonna consider that this appearance of being creative is enough for our purpose, which is to produce uh, art. Uh, we can go back to this discussion on the, on the, when we are talking after the presentation. And uh, the third question would be, can computers appear to recognize creativity? Which is the problem that we were raising when we were talking about Kant, saying that the problem, uh, first of all, is not that it doesn't look like the problem is to produce things. The problem is to recognize and select uh, if what we are producing is good or not, which for the computer today, uh, in order for it to recognize, it needs to be taught. Uh, but, but, but we are also taught when we're, we're growing up our art skills to recognize what is what we like and what we don't, what would be judged by some group of people, even, even if we work with uh, uh, relational um, opinions. I mean, uh, we can recognize for a specific group what could be considered a good art and bad art, even if it's different from, from other group. Uh, that today, the computer needs to be taught to. And uh, the fourth question is, can computers be creative? Well, that's uh, as Nicholas uh, likes to, to, to say, 
it will be depending on the on the meaning that we give to the word creative uh, if that uh, word creative is a uh, human specific characteristic and it's compounded by many many uh, many items that you have to bundle up together in order to be called creative and that's specifically only for humans then they won't you not be creative there will be something else but they they are producing uh, things so uh, Margaret Bowden is uh, working out three forms of creativity, which she calls three surprises. So the first surprise is making unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. Actually, if you if you think about creativity on a common sense uh, definition, if you if you start go around and ask people. You know, that answer is going to show up many times. So what is creativity? Creativity is putting things together that already exist, but were never thought to be together before. Uh, so this is the first time you are, you're putting uh, familiar things in an unfamiliar uh, combination. That can happen uh, for... Uh, person's history specifically. So uh, it's, uh, uh, of course, teachers uh, see that more in classrooms when the students uh, learn something, which is the first time they are learning or they are making that connection for themselves. And that's like a eureka moment for them. But that has happened many, many times. It actually happens every year when you teach something uh, and you say, oh, He's just discovering something by himself, which is a great discovery, something uh, wonderful. Uh, but for humanity, it's already being done many, many times. Actually, it's being part of some educational process, something. And so what we usually uh, think we have a, a wonderful idea. And then we're, we find the book that was written about our great idea, and we see that someone has already thought on that before and we're kind of like we're a little bit disappointed because uh, we thought our great idea was unique but uh, it actually is just a process that's very common which is you are making a connection that is uh, new to you but not to humanity the second one that on this combination that uh, Margaret Bodden talks about is a combination that's new for humanity so it, it is someone who is making a connection or putting together familiar things in an unfamiliar way. Uh, but it's also the first time that uh, humanity makes that connection. The second surprise uh, would be exploring conceptual spaces. And the, the uh, conceptual spaces are important for, for Bowden because they work a little bit uh, similar to the paradigm of Thomas Kuhn. So you have a system and within that system, you go to the borders of the system, you stretch a little bit and you try to make some uh, connections on the frontier of, of other areas. So um, I'm doing this analogous here, for example, on the, um, on the first surprise, we just, we just put things together. On the second surprise, we we'll, we'll explore uh, the system, for example, when Newton uh, talks about gravity, if he sees things falling, but he's going to come up with a new explanation for the for the way things are are, are that way. So he's he's stretching a little bit, but still within the same system because he's he's still nature, he's still being able to look at and and and, and realize uh, that that same thing that is there. You're just looking at a different way, but the, the, it, it is still there. The third surprise uh, in terms of the, the creation that Bowden explores is transforming this space, the conceptual space. Transforming the conceptual space is uh, going beyond what is already established in terms of a paradigm and, and creating a new paradigm. So for example, when we talk about relativity and we say that matter distorts space, uh, that's not uh, 
that, that's not easy to to accept you have to to jump out of the system and and, uh, and look at a, a different angle in terms of uh, how you're visualizing something and it's not intuitional because when you look at it you say no that that's not what i'm seeing so that's a, a, a this jump beyond the system is what uh, bottom would call the third surprise so here's a it's, it's, i'm going back to my research because uh so what we're seeing that's here on the familiar if we put together uh familiar things in an unfamiliar combination sometimes you can say oh but that's uh you know that's a, a cat duck uh that, it doesn't make sense that's uh that's something that are is together and if you if your computer comes up with a that thing you maybe uh could make fun of it and say oh you know that's that's just some random thing that uh, came out also I'm, now i'm going back a little bit to my research if a computer uh gives out a, a, a judiciary decision that doesn't make sense you're going to make fun of the computer because you say oh you're just like you know, just coming up with something very strange uh but actually if if a human writes it and then it becomes something even more strange because it's not supposed to behave randomly let me show you a um oh, oh, Ed, i'll try to translate to you the the uh, thing that's written here, it's from our Supreme Court. It's a decision from one of the one of the justices. And it says, so here's a uh, Nabias corpus. It's uh, someone is is in jail. They are trying to to decide if the, the person deserves to be uh, freed from from jail or not. And then the the person in charge of the case said it, it's gonna her vote was for for liberating the person here's the another justice that's joining the same vote saying okay I, I'll, I'll i'll here are my compliments to uh the, 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 the her vote and only only god can can decide things not humans we're not under this sphere of cognition. But I can verify, uh, talking about God, that the stars today are aligned for the concession of the habeas corpus. And then another justice intervenes and says, oh, I confess I'm, I'm feeling a very in a very strange place from that one that I'm usually uh, on Tuesdays. And then the, the voter comes back and says, yeah, that's why I believe in God, but I also believe in astrology stars are aligned today in a very favorable conjunction to the the ones that are requesting habeas corpus so this is a uh, this is a decision from our supreme court um made by human uh that if you would uh say that that was made by a, a computer someone would say okay that's just a bug you know something went wrong here because how can you justify that you're going to free someone because the stars are aligned. Uh, so here's the, the an example of uh, maybe we are being too severe on, on computers uh, outputs and not uh, always questioning what, what human outputs are, are, are showing here. <clears throat> and now for the fun part, I'm gonna share some some music here made by AI. Let me just stop sharing this. Oh, so the first first um, song we're gonna hear is a very electronic thing. We can understand that's being produced by an AI in terms of finding some patterns and and creating the the rhythm. Let me just share here. I'll try to share sound.
I'm not going to play the, the entire song because the point here is not to listen to it, but to understand the pattern. So this, this is a, a song generated by, by an AI based on, on, on patterns of electronic music. And now let's see, can you see this one? It, did, it, did my screen change? I don't know if I'm sharing everything. Okay. This uh, Mr. Shadow, a song composed by artificial intelligence. There you, uh, we also give the computer some, some patterns and then it decides. more like a American songbook type of, of rhythm, uh, like a folk, pop folk music. Okay, so now, so this is, you can see that there's a difference here, something more electronic, would, we could say that's more uh, programmable. Uh, this one, it adds some other elements, but then let's see what happens when the computer is fed with Beatles songs and you say, okay, listen to, Beatles and give me a song that looks like a Beatles song, which is Daddy's Car. So for those who like uh, Beatles, you can see the there's a very similar to a, to a Beatles song. Let me go back to the presentation here. Stop sharing. <laughs> okay, so let's see that if there's anything in the chat here. <clears throat> and this is the there's uh developments on the area of music creation that um, it's uh, an algorithm, not embodied algorithm who is uh, producing songs, but there's also an example here of the, the guitar player, the robot guitar player, which is more like embodied type of AI. Um, so have we, what, what can we say about that? So that musics have syntax, uh, even when improvised is in, underway. Um, what we're saying here is on this paper by Ramon Mantras is that uh, computational creativity is the, so it's a study of building software that exhibits behavior that would be deemed creative in humans. That's uh, Mantara's definition. Such creativity, uh, such creative software can be used for autonomous creative tasks, such as inventing 
mathematical theories, writing poems, painting pictures, and composing music. However, computational creativity studies also enables us to understand human creativity and to produce programs for creative people to use, where the software acts as a creative collaborator rather than a mere tool. Historically, it has been difficult for society to come to terms with machines that purport to be intelligent, even more difficult to admit that they might be creative. Uh, so uh, what he's saying here is that not uh, the um, most probable uh, development, uh, but like this first uh, step on creativity, is not going to be to delegate everything to humans in terms of creativity, but to use uh, AI as a tool to enhance human creativity. Uh, we're gonna go back to the enhancements before at the end of the presentation, but uh, it looks like, uh, uh, the, uh, of course, we see that on, on, on cartoons, on, on everything that we're delegating part of, of the task, everything that's repetitive, but uh, the, main, the main creative, uh, the main creator, would be still be called the human who directs the the algorithm to the direction that it wants to go. Um, oh, okay. Oops, sorry. The enhanced humans are here. So uh, what were we seeing you know, on the creative side is that, for example, as early as um, 1962, uh, Douglas Elbert wrote about a writing machine that would permit to use uh, a new process of composing text. We can integrate your new ideas more easily and thus harness your creativity more continuously. Ego's red vision was not only about augmenting individual creativity, he also wanted to augment the collective intelligence and creativity of groups by improving collaboration and group problem solving ability. The basic idea is that creativity is a social process that can be augmented through technology. By projecting these ideas to the future, he could imagine a world where creativity is highly accessible and almost anyone can write at the level of the best writers, paint like the great masters, compose high quality music, and even discover new forms of creative expression. For a person who does not have a particular creative skill, gaining a new capability through assisted creation systems is highly empowering. Uh, so although the above futuristic scenario is current pure fiction, there already exist several examples of assisted creation. One of the most interesting assisted uh, drumming system uh, developed by the, um, to play with the, the three arms, the 61 centimeter long smart arm can be attached to a musician's shoulder. It responds to human gestures and the music it hears. When the drummer plays the hi-hat symbol, for example, the robot are maneuvers to play the right, right symbol. It's, uh, the, it's, when the drummer switches to the snare, the mechanical arm shifts to the tom. Uh, we, we're seeing that uh, the, the first use of the um, algorithms here are not to uh, do everything by themselves, but to enhance human properties. And that's a, uh, uh, oh, there was another day we were discussing with Professor Netamar, the, the presentation that we had a couple of weeks ago regarding human enhancement. And that's uh, pretty much a, a area that uh, has been a, seen a lot of investments uh, recently in terms of enhancements. And uh, that's gonna go to, to the art as well. Uh, so here we jump to another another topic here, which is does creation require imagination? Uh, let's talk a little bit on go back to Aristotle again on, on Fantasia in the Anima Peripsychus. Uh, let me clean my screen here so I'm able to read. Aristotle is saying that. Fantasia is that in virtue of which we say an image, which is a phantasma, arises in us. So there's a, a, a model for Aristotelian psychology based on Fantasia, where you have the physical image of the object. Uh, on, the, on the sense perception uh, scheme, you have a perceived image, which would be the first order uh, phantasma. 
and on the uh, Fantasia, the Fantasmata on the second order of Fantasia would be the one that's being, uh, which is able to be manipulated in our mind in terms of uh, creation. Um, so what, what, what is important here? So it's clear, therefore, let me read the, the other um, citation here. It is clear, therefore, that Fantasia will be neither believed together with perception or belief through perception, nor a blend of belief and perception. So what is, what is Aristotle saying here? Uh, Good, one more here. Since Fantasia is thought to be a kind of movement, so he says it's a kind of movement, this movement cannot exist apart from perception or in things which do not perceive and in respect of it, it is possible for its possessor to do and to be affected by many things. And it may be both true and false. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, perceptive fantasia then, as has been said, belongs also to other animals. But deliberate fantasia belongs only to rational animals for whether to do this or that. Is all right. So it, yeah, it's a... Uh, here is saying that only rational animals can manipulate the, the fantasia, is already the work of rational faculty. And it is necessary to measure by one, for a person pursues the greater and so must be able to make one out of many images, fantasmata. Uh, so what's the problem here? Uh, Deborah Modric on Aristotle and Fantasia article says that, um, this, uh, she asks, does Aristotle have a comprehensive and unified account of Fantasia? Aristotle appeals to Fantasia in a wide variety of contexts. He consistently identifies roles for it in sensory experience, in memory, and in dreaming, in thinking, and in acting. In light of this, one might suspect that he is using the same term for very different cognitive activities, which is. Um, it's very interesting because <clears throat> maybe uh, imagination is involved in all those types of activities. We tend to associate uh, imagination uh, with only uh, creation. We tend to say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm, so he's a very imaginative person, so he can create because he uses well his imagination as if imagination is only linked to uh, new things. But in fact, what we are seeing here is that uh, we might be uh, calling this uh, concept of imagination or recalling this concept of imagination to all other cognitive, it, it's uh, intrinsic to the all these other cognitive activities because you need to represent, uh, represent objects. You need the representation in order to act to think uh, and to do some other activities. So uh, what we're saying is that here, maybe um, uh, Aristotle wasn't wrong when he was using the same word for all these different types of cognitive activities. activities. And we, maybe we uh, are the ones who separated imagination and linked it only to, to creation and disregarded uh, the role of imagination on, on the other uh, cognitive activities. So when we look here, uh, hold on just a second. I think it jumped to one. No, it's on the wrong position. I will go back to it. Uh, Michel Polanyi talks about the, the child learning to ride a bike. Let me get here the part that Polanyi talks about it. So Polony offers um, frequent analogies with both uh, muscle learning and visual perception. Uh, consider a child learning to ride a bike, for example. The child forms an intention to ride the bicycle, but of course, because she doesn't yet know how to do this, she has only a loose imagining of the aim of the outcome. This imaginative intention is a rough, non-stepwise way of pushing the agent towards the goal, aided by the feedback that comes with the combining different uh, actions, turning the 
handlebar this way or that, pedaling versus not pedaling, plus losing her balance, uh, falling, managing some distance without falling, and so on. As one may recall, at some point, uh, uh, something spontaneous happens, something clicks. So this idea of the click is the idea of the something is unknown, uh, but it's uh, uh, now it's learned by the the, the one who, who has the imagination, but it doesn't know how it came to that. All of this feedback between world and agent provides clues, most of which the average person could never articulate. And these clues guide one closer to the aim toward a coherent method for riding the bicycle. So according to Polanyi, intuition is the faculty that responds to these clues and that ultimately provides the spontaneous click. This, uh, this is how I do it uh, for the learner. Polanyi identifies the same structure in visual perception, consider perceiving uh, some ambiguous figures. Uh, so I'm saying what we're seeing here is a, uh, a, a idea that's going back to the same Kantian uh, idea that there's something here that cannot be programmable. Um, you cannot uh, understand how uh, it came up with the, the, the knowledge, but uh, somehow you, we did. And that that's, uh, would be the, the, the example of the Charlo and the bike. Uh, we, we know about the Polonius paradox that so we can know more than we can tell, which is this tacit knowledge. On the um, visual perception, for example. So when, how do we know, sorry. How do we know uh, when we start seeing uh, the figure one way and we, uh, when we stop seeing the figure one way and we start seeing the figure the other way? Uh, how, does it, how does the process of finding out the different figure comes, come to your, our minds? on the, uh, what computer still can do. <coughs> uh, the, uh, the author Dreyfus is, is still defending that the non-programmable human capacities uh, it's, are involved in all forms of intelligent behavior. So here he's saying that, uh, this is the correct, uh, correctors. Sorry about the spelling here because the corrector outcorrects. Uh, what I say is that there are non uh, non rule like non rule like activities. Uh, there are non programmable human activities that uh, he calls uh, that would be bundled up in this essence of what uh, intelligence is. But the the question is that are there non rule like activities? They are the result of unconscious followed rules. So we're just not perceiving how we uh, come up with something which we think is mysterious and, and obscure, but uh, does it actually uh, unconsciously, we are following steps and that's uh, maybe programmable. Satri is, uh, has a, a separation of reproductive imagination versus uh, productive imagination. Being the reproductive imagination more linked to an empiricist, um, concept and then the productive imagination more flexible. Uh, and this productive imagination is the one that would be essential for the creation of the self. Why? Because you can manipulate it, it's flexible. Uh, Jeanette, Jeanette has the book of Self-Deceiving, which is a very interesting book where he talks about the importance of self-deceiving uh, yourself in terms of uh, uh, reaching goals because you think of yourself as uh, in one point of the book, he, he talks about the image that we make our, ourselves uh, in the future <clears throat> with some profession or achieving some uh, result is very important for us to make us believe that we are uh, able to do that because we can imagine ourselves in that position. Now, let me correct the word of the slides because uh, I saw that it was wrong. Hold on just a second. This is the um, side that comes after starts. So on, on Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, mental image has four characteristics, intentional, 
uh, imagery is quasi observational. <clears throat> Perceived objects come as present while images are not present. And passivity of perception and voluntary spontaneity of imagination um, would be a, a, the fourth characteristic. I, I ask if we don't have a contradiction here because the, uh, the statism seems to ignore the role of uh, reassessment of a perception when we, uh, when we continually come back to the perception. We can say that the, uh, the voluntary, uh, the, the imagination is mainly a voluntary uh, spontaneity. Uh, and the combination of these four elements give us images uh, they are distinctly creative power. <clears throat> so rep uh, representing in imagination then is a creative conscious activity for certain. In the image, that representative element is the product of a conscious activity, is shot through with a flow of creative will. Sartre, applies this account to our uptake of literally and performance arts. When one reads a novel, there is a series of explicit statements describing the characters and events of the story. But as many contemporary philosophers have noted, the story is not exhausted by these descriptions. Rather, the author will rely upon the reader to fill in details left out by these explicit descriptions. So going back to that uh, uh, characteristic that we saw on, on Aristotle, uh, even uh, imagination is even important for a uh, very day-to-day -day activity like reading, for example. Uh, it's not only creating an art, um, but that is valid for any narrative. Uh, so whenever we are we're saying anything, our brain needs to be constantly creating to process narratives. Is that creation the same as composing a symphony? So I'm just going back to Aristotle uh, saying that imagery permeates uh, all these cognitive activities. <clears throat> now I go back to another example of creativity. Uh, here is a <clears throat> cooking with Chef Watson. So Watson is the, the IBM's uh, AI. Uh, they created an app and, the, and Watson started making suggestions that no human would ever make, like adding milk chocolate to a clam linguine or mayonnaise to a Blood Mary. And then what people found is that that was actually very good. Uh, it, 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 that's just the first, uh, like putting uh, known things together in a different way first, uh, so it's not um, going to the second and third surprises of Margaret Bolden, uh, but it's um, it's just on the first step of surprises, so it's just combining uh, different things. Yeah. So what I'm saying here, I already said that in a, I don't know who, who was presenting the day I said that, but uh, we might suspect that we, a little bit that we are human biased uh, in terms of um, trying to add characteristics in order to be able to say that a computer is creative or uh, that a computer can uh, do X and Y cognitive activity. Uh, and we add some characteristics that would be non-fundamental just to say that that's not uh, uh, that's not creativity because only humans can have creativity and uh, why? Because we are adding some characteristic that for the output may be irrelevant. Uh, here's a just a joke on the Turing test. So the next step of the Turing test would be to for the computer to try to to put in question what's the examiner's identity. Uh, so what are we testing the Turing test, for example? Are we really testing language capability or are we testing humanity? Because if we always find out a, uh, another uh, example of something that the computer is not able to do, oh, but you are not, to, you are not laughing of, uh, when I make a joke or not doing something uh, that I expected a, a human to do, maybe you are not testing language capability, you are testing 
humanity and the computer will never pass that test as if you're testing other things and uh, and put some requirements that have, that are composed of uh, some characteristics that are not fundamental for the test. And the other, so the other point here I wanna talk about creativity is uh, the mind should be capital letter there because it's the company and games. I don't know how many of you have seen the AlphaGo uh, movie. It's, uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, it's on YouTube because DeepMind is owned by Google who owns YouTube. So that's where the, the movie is, is free there. Uh, but uh, when, when Demi uh, started um, working with games in terms of can AI be creative and, the, and the, the movie is pretty much about creativity on games. So you have these uh, three, uh, basic, you have these three levels of games that you would uh, consider. One is uh, tic tac toe. Tic tac toe is jogo da velha. Okay. Uh, the second one is chess, and then we would have go. So what would be the difference to them? Tic tac toe is very easy. I mean, it's just very few movements, and then you you it's very it's very programmable. You don't even need to do machine learning on tic tac toe. You, you need to do a basic algorithm that uh, teaches the machine how to do crosses and circles, and and eventually uh, you learn how the how the best uh, algorithm for it. Chess is a little bit different because the possible combinations of chess are gigantic, but they are not infinite. Uh, they are gigantic in terms of um, uh, a lot of them are are not good moves, so you can eliminate. But but even if you can eliminate, if you have uh, a lot of process capability, you can leave them there. You don't need to to develop the uh, the the shortcuts on the on the program because now with with a huge uh, process capability, you are able to process every move in chess because uh, it's a uh, it's a very, very large number, but it's a finite number. Uh, whereas in Go, the problem is the number of possible movements. And that it was an area where before people would say, oh, that's, that's only for humans. Why? Because it needs intuition. And then intuition was used as some characteristic that would be kind of cognitive but kind of non-cognitive because it's obscure and then you're attributing to only a human the capability of knowing what would be the right move to do not because you can calculate the best move but because you have an intuition on where you should go and that works a lot for justice too i mean what is to be what is to be just what is not to be, is this a good decision uh, I'm doing a parallel here with my research because uh, the same argument that uh, Go players would make about that, that's only a human can know where to go in terms of how to play the best movement here in Go. It's also a characteristic that's today attributed only to, to humans. Only humans have a look at a situation and can perceive if that's, uh, if that's just or not. Are we doing, are we doing the right thing here? Uh, uh, is this the right thing to do? It is very. It would be very human, uh, attributive, and not uh, delegated to computers. Uh, so what we see here is that uh, with the uh, with the developments that DeepMind made. Let me see if I can put here uh, a part of the movie that uh, that shows how computers can actually be creative in terms of uh, playing a game, and that uh, actually can. Uh, extrapolate that to other other areas. So what, what we're going to see here is that, for example, the computer was uh, learning how to play a basic uh, Atari game. Let me stop share here and find the other screen. And then it come up, it it came up with a, an idea on how to do the how to optimize its result without the programmers intended to for it to be, let me just share here. Do, do, do. Can you see? Can you see the the screen here? Can Can you hear me, or or am I muted? I can hear you. 
Okay, so let me just. Okay, I'm gonna I'm, I'll, I'll I'll mute them as here, <laughs> but I'm just saying. So the computer here is learning how to how to play a, a basic uh, game. Let me see if I can put the. I'll go back here a little bit. I'm just gonna share the sound too because I wasn't. is this notion of generality. So we wanted one single system to be able to play all the different games out of the box. So I'm going to time as it gets more experience playing more games and starts to figure out what's happening in the game. So this is what it looks like after 100 games. And you can see the system is starting to get the hang of um, what it's supposed to be doing. So it's supposed to move the bat towards the ball, but it's missing the ball most of the time. But it's starting to get the idea that maybe it's a good idea to move the bat towards the ball. And then after 300 games, um, so now you can see it's about as good as any human can play this. And it almost never misses the ball anymore, even when it's coming back at very fast angles. So we thought, well, yeah, this is great. But what happens if um, we left it playing for another 200 games? And to our surprise, what it did is it found this optimal strategy, which was to dig a tunnel around the left-hand side and then send the ball behind the, the brick wall, which was you know, sort of an amazing solution to the problem in a way. OK, so what we, what we saw here is that the computer found out a solution that was not forecasted in the original uh, program. It was a surprise. I mean, so that's that's being creative. I'm creative. Why? Because they came up with a solution that no one thought, even maybe what Demis was saying here is that maybe even the programmers didn't think about that possibility that the computer could use the back of the of the the other the other side. And I, I thought it was very, very interesting. Um, so on, on, when we think about I mean, games, games are a very good uh, way of thinking about creativity because of, on, on this side, for example, for Go, uh, I'm not going to play here the the, uh, the Go part of the Go movie. But what, what we actually did is that so it, the computer beat the, the most experienced Go uh, player uh, because it was able to come up with uh, some moves that in the beginning, what happened is, is that when he, when he played some moves, uh, everyone thought the computer was a little bit crazy. Well, no, that's a bug because no human would play a strange move like that. But that uh, actually was something that the computer was thinking ahead many, many, many uh, hands on the game. Uh, and, and, and all those moves were considered to be creative because they were not, uh, inten they were not uh, calculated. But what we're uh, what DeepMind is arguing here is that that comes out of calculation. Uh, so all of this creativity uh, is a way of optimizing the function, the reward function. So when you're optimizing the reward function, you might come up with some solutions that uh, you go through a different uh, path in order to optimize your equation. But uh, if you're, you're optimizing your reward uh, function, actually what we're doing is, is you're searching for new ways and the computer is faster in searching new ways of or new paths in order to optimize something when you give them uh, a test. Uh, that was it. Uh, I think I, I think we have some material here to, to trigger some discussions. As I said, uh, the subject is very spread out. I mean, there's 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 some discussions on on imagination and philosophy, but that's not very linked to creativity. I think that's an area that we're going to see a lot of uh, development because it's following some surprises we're seeing on 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 computer. And thank you very much. I, I'll I'll leave you to for discussions now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Guilherme. Thank you very much for uh, the very interesting uh, presentation. We have a question from Professor Nitamar. Professor, please. Thank you, Guilherme. That was a very, very interesting presentation of yours. I really enjoyed every single uh, aspect of it. There will be so many questions, but let me just ask one single question 
relating to uh, intuition, which appeared in several parts of your presentation. And of course, I'm not expecting you to come up with uh, uh, an acceptable uh, definition of intuition, because this is one of the most uh, controversial uh, concepts in, uh, in philosophy of mind, but also in philosophy of language and uh, epistemology, right? There are so many different ways of uh, defining intuition. But I'm particularly interested in intuition in so far as uh, creativity is concerned, because you gave the example of uh, Newton's, uh, uh, you know, his idea of, uh, or, or his intuition about uh, gravity. Uh, you know, when we think of this, uh, this story of the apple falling on his head, etc. And the, uh, the interesting thing though, to, uh, to keep in mind when we talk about Isaac Newton is that uh, in fact, he, he did a lot of uh, math, right? He had created uh, infinitesimal uh, calculus was simultaneously uh, developed by Newton and Leibniz. And the uh, interesting thing also is that, of course, he resorted to uh, Kepler's three laws of planetary orbit when he uh, was trying to figure out how to use, uh, you know, this, uh, this idea of uh, the distance between the planets and to come up with the law of uh, universal uh, gravitation. And furthermore, for the whole thing of gravity itself, he was also very much influenced by uh, Galileo's own discoveries about uh, the law of acceleration. And it was basically the same experiment, just like the, the apple falling on Isaac Newton's head. We can think of uh, Galileo's uh, dropping balls from the Tower of Pisa, right? And uh, therefore, the, the, my point is that uh, if we think of all the math involved, it's not that there was something uh, so intuitive, but it was much more related to the, uh, to the other examples you gave in your talk. There was going to be a question of, of time. It's a matter of time that given all the mathematics involved, someone would come up with <laughs> the law of gravity or uh, you know, universal gravitation. If you think of all the different developments, in uh, mathematical physics, it's uh, understandable that someone like Newton would come up with this, just like Einstein uh, a couple of centuries later would come up with relativity. We can also refer it to uh, different experiments that were conducted regarding the uh, speed of light. But again, this is not to say that there is no role for intuition. Because I think that part of your very interesting uh, remark you made about uh, Polanyi's book, you no know, Polanyi, uh, I, I had read that book, uh, Personal Knowledge. It, it's a great book. Everyone should read that book. And, uh, and of course, uh, Polanyi was also known for his idea of a tacit knowledge, as you uh, mentioned. And uh, of course, intuition would be a form of tacit knowledge meaning that there are many forms of a knowledge. It's not only propositional uh, knowledge as we have in epistemology, but when you think of a body or corporeal knowledge, right? In terms of practice, for instance, a tennis player knows how to move his body in certain ways. And so this would be more of a phenomenological approach uh, to knowledge. But uh, my question to you then is precisely when you when you mentioned uh, in, in the last part of your presentation, the experiments with, uh, you know, those games like Atari uh, uh, games uh, involving artificial uh, intelligence and uh, creativity, that perhaps uh, the machine was learning how to simulate something that humans would be doing. This is part of the story of when you mentioned the human bias 
I think this is a very good way of approaching it. When you say that machine learning has a lot to do with learning how to be biased like humans, but on the other hand, as you, uh, as you explained, uh, perhaps humans would not allow, uh, would not think of anything intuitive about resorting to that upper level as the, uh, you know, the AI came up with that solution. So it was creative in a way that it's even, even more related to some uh, uh, universe of mathematical probabilities as opposed to anything human. So my question is precisely, how do you deal with uh, intuitions if it's only understood in human terms? Because if intuitions are going to be something that's biased or confined to the way humans behave, uh, it would be very uh, funny to think that there is something intuitive about AI going in a certain direction that no one thought about, right? So uh, I don't know how, uh, do, do you see my point? I, I'm trying to make sense of, uh, on, on the one hand, the whole thing that intuition could be part of tacit knowledge, as Polanyi uh, very interestingly uh, remarked. You know, he had this idea that uh, not all knowledge is something that's going to be made explicit. But on the other hand, we assume that machine learning is trying to uh, simulate human approaches to, uh, to problems, right? When you, we, we think in terms of a problem solving, this is one of, of the issues that Nicholas has been uh, asking a lot. Are we always confined to something like human intelligence, right? But in fact, perhaps we're going beyond human intelligence because, you know, when you come up with a solution, like in those games, that were never uh, thought of by human beings, that means that there is something intuitive, but in a non-human way. And uh, therefore, it's very tricky. How, how can you think of intuition that is not human? So this is my question for you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so let me uh, let me try to answer that. Then, then we go to uh, let me just uh, otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll pile up too many things here. Um, so I think the the I think the issue is precisely that we have to start separate some things here in terms of what is uh, carbon and what is silic, right? Uh, in, uh, that that's a discussion that's been going on. Um, so the way I think of intuition, of course, I'm, I'm just let, let me let me start from a point, and then we can discuss if that's a, a good point to start or not. In in psychology, you, we usually think about intuition in terms of jumping steps, right? So we are uh, I don't know how I did it, but I, I, I the tennis player hits the ball because he has an intuition where the ball is going to be on the next second, and then he's able to do that. But that's that's basically an idea of uh, jumping steps. I'm able to do that calculation in another way, uh, but I, I, I can, I'm because I have training and because I have a, 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 some baggage, some some knowledge uh, baggage. I can I can jump some steps. The other the other concept of intuition we have would be a more philosophical one. That would be immediate knowledge. So knowledge that is not mediated by something. Uh, and then we can we we, we talk about intuition because uh, we have direct access to some kind of knowledge. Well, I'm more interested on, on this on this psychology first example that I gave because the main point that we are discussing here is that I think we have to to there are, obviously there are two two streams here. Uh, one that is saying that uh, this step jumping capability comes and can be. Uh, debugged into, and you can you can learn how you jump steps, but you can and it, it, there is some calculation that's undergoing that that's been going on, and there is another another side that's saying that this intuition, which is to jump some steps, relies on something that cannot be uh, converted into calculation. Uh, right now, I mean, I I'm not I'm not uh, defending one or 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 the other, but the AI community is for sure taking the side of the intuition 
uh, on jumping some steps that can be debugged into and 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 understand and, and it can be understood and then you can you can you can go and program it um so, so in that sense what i think there's there's some mechanization of human thoughts here obviously is that the the ai the the, the main part of the ai community uh especially the companies what they are saying is that uh this intuition so if, uh, what we call intuition is actually some black box uh, that we are don't know how it works inside it but it's time to open the box and learn how what's been going on there and that can be traceable uh so uh, uh, is this is this how we called intuition in terms of jumping of knowing how to do something without explaining how we can do it so uh, the tested knowledge that uh, Polanyi is talking about the AI community would defend that that's that's actually accumulated knowledge that's being uh, converted into a simple programming line that does many activities so it's just like like you can go step by step or you can uh, bundle up everything on a block and do it uh, as one step and that's what we, uh, that what he, humans would call intuition, but that's actually not intuition. It's just a bundle up of many steps that we found a simple way to to uh, to perform that task. Um, I, I'm not. I, I mean, personally, I'm as I said, I'm not sure if that's the way I would go now because I, I don't think I have enough uh, reading and, and and thought about the 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 term. But but it's clear that uh, on this on this path what we are seeing is that uh, attempts uh, on trying to how to to open this black box of intuition in this concept that intuition is just steps that are bundled up and intuition is nothing mysterious intuition is nothing and 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 when we apply to a computer what we're seeing is that the computer is finding some ways to to do something but that's not mysterious that's just a a, a way that the computer found to to maximize its reward function and because it's able to do that trillions of times in in, in a minute because of the, the the computational capabilities we have today is that we humans think of it as a mystery because it's too fast for our cognition to be able to do all these steps and we only see that when a human does something that looks like intuition because he he bundle up all his uh, his knowledge in the steps uh, before and he's doing that uh, uh, in front of us and we think that that's intuition but it's actually also accumulated knowledge uh, uh in humans and in, in machines i don't know if i if i if i answered the question but i i think that right now uh, what we what we are trying to to do here in in, in terms of uh, how how to deal with the concept of intuition is that we have to recognize that there are some different ways people uh, want to define intuition um, which is not in a, in a, in a in this philosophical way of uh, non-mediated knowledge but it's um, uh, it's uh, one of them i mean we have to, to choose one of them in order to develop and then when we finish this line of thought we have to go back and say okay what if intuition for the ones who who defended intuition is a mysterious thing. Well, then, then we we are in another in another category here. I don't think we are we're going to into cognitive science if we if we think that there is some unexplainable uh, component in the definition of intuition. I think we can we can go through the AI path only if we can uh, defend that we have explanation uh, that that can be explained. I think that, that was the, the path. Uh, thanks, Guilherme. Ed, please go ahead. All right. Um, thank you so much, Guy, for your for your presentation. I I think this was like um a very thought-provoking um, presentation. And um, so my it's not necessarily like a a question. So I, I was just having a kind of thought provoking uh, moment when you were presenting. And um, one of the things that I was looking at is the fact that um, returning back to um, what um, the Professor Natama was saying, I think that in we have, as humans, we have a certain kind of conception of intuition. So uh, because uh, we have this 
it, it seems like we have a programmable um, notion of intuition. And as a result of that, we also want, let's say, um, machine AI to fit into our notion of uh, conceptualizing intuition. So let us look at the game, for instance, and let me just make an analogy with, let's say, a PhD thesis now, for instance. Um, a PhD thesis is um, a researcher standing on other researches of other people. So let's say you stand on the research of other people and then you produce new knowledge. And I feel like the, these very games are actually what um, AI has done standing first on the algorithms, the data collected, the data that have been fed to AI um, um, machine and, and machines, and then it has produced a profound way of doing things. And for me, I feel like this profound way of doing things is what I would call creativity, because it is not streamlined to our notion of creativity. And let's say, for instance, um, I was looking at some work on AI, and I saw that currently, even if AI um, depends on the data that we feed AI, there is this whole notion of the Hetzian network where machines intercommunicate with themselves and they try to, um, to bring up suggestions. So let's say if a machine analyzes your data and brings up suggestions, I feel that that is also creativity. And, and if we go back again to the, the earlier part of your presentation, where you were looking at um, the, the whole uh, Lady Lovelace um, uh, um, analytical engine and the, and the rest. And I think the, the first problem of AI and creativity came up around the Turing test. During the first Turing test, I think it was one of Turing's objection where Turing was um, uh, analyzing an objection that states that um, AI cannot be sentient because AI lacks consciousness and AI um, lacks, um, uh, AI cannot also um, make, produce art. And I was so super, I hadn't really explored the area of art, performance art and the rest, um, aspect of art that AI has gone until today. And I'm so I'm really, really astonished by, by this because, and I looked at it and one of the questions that I was asking is that it brings me back to the whole concept of um, the Negelian approach where ne Negel, Thomas Negel asked the question, uh, what is it like to be like a bat? So if we say AI is less creative, then we are taking our human bias to AI, to defining creativity according to the human approach towards creativity. Whereas AI approach towards creativity might be different. And, but the, 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 the advantage with this is that even if AI approach to creativity is different, AI approach to creativity also interconnects with the human approach to creativity. Because like, for instance, now the whole music, the whole art and the rest, that is human approach to creativity. And AI is actually doing that. And even if we want to also say that creativity is a human thing, then we can run ourselves into problems. Because let's say, um, I was also making a, a thought experiment in my head while you were presenting. And I was like, okay, let's say we give birth to, to 50 children and we separate these children from the rest of the world. And let's say for 20 years, and then bring them back to the world. I don't think they would understand the concept of creativity the same way people in the world understand creativity. So I, like I said, it's not a question. It's just that I'm just astonished by this concept. This, I have never thought about looking at AI from when I got that impression that, okay, AI has a problem with the whole thing about performance art and creative art, I hadn't really explored it up until now. And I really think that this is actually like a very, very interesting presentation. Although I'll, I'll think about that. There was a question that came into my head earlier on. I'll just think about it while I allow Nicholas to, to ask the question. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Ed. Uh, Guillermo, for okay. okay. Uh, yes, uh, Ed, it's very, very interesting because um, what the, one of the first problems that we have here in terms of our relation with AI is to attribute intentional states to an algorithm. So when we say, okay, hold on just a second, my computer is thinking here, it's processing. So, but we say it's thinking. The computer, what happened with the autonomous car? The autonomous car, for example, when we say the autonomous car didn't want to, to steer and, and, and hit the wall. So if we attribute some, some intentional, uh, intentional states to AI, uh, that's maybe part of the part of the problem we have to to deal with in the next years is try to come up with some vocabulary that's more appropriate to the tasks that AI is performing. So we cannot uh, so we we get to free our, ourselves from this uh, thing of calling AI creative or call uh, systems intelligent or or not. I know Nicholas loves this this issue about uh, the the vocabulary problems, but but, but it, it is true. I mean, that some of these uh, some of these uh, vocabulary issues are actually um, not letting us uh, define, or or maybe we're confusing everything uh, on the same pot here. Uh, we we would need to separate how we how we define creativity in terms of a human creativity or uh, or machine creativity. So we would need some vocabulary to. to specifically say that we're dealing with human creativity or machine creativity. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be uh, mixing these uh, two things, and that could be a problem. For example, when we, when we, when we say that uh, uh, algorithms are, are programming, they are creating some other things. Maybe we would say that, uh, that, that that's something else. It, it's traceable. And, uh, uh, but if we uh, search for essentialist approach. So uh, the problem of the essentialist approach is that we we keep adding things in the essence of intelligence, in the essence of creativity that cannot be found in machines. And then we're we're trying to develop systems that uh, will be able to meet this criteria of these uh, items that we called. Uh, items that are uh, a component of the essential characteristics and we're not going to be able and then we say okay so uh, um, this machine is not intelligent because it doesn't have conscience for example and, and, and but but then we're not trying to do artificial intelligence it's artificial intelligence because it's artificial if we're, if we're trying to create an intelligence or a human intelligence then it's some other thing so if we if we start to to say that to be an artificial intelligence, you need to have some human characteristics, then it's not artificial anymore. <laughs> it's trying to create another human intelligence. Uh, uh, and, and, and all these uh, issues about, so, so that's the first uh, part of the, the question. The other thing is that on the bias is that, for example, when, when the machine is using all our data that we produce and this data is biased, uh, of course, the machine is going to replicate this this bias into the machine. But what I'm saying is that there's a double bias thing here in in, in discussion. There's the bias that uh, the machine is replicating the human bias that comes with our activity, so it is permeated in our data. And there's the bias that we humans have towards we humans. That the, the the bias that we say that okay. Uh, the, the humans have towards humanity. The, the only humanity will be able to do that. Or, and then you're, you're using a bias that is a bias uh, that we say that humans do better something. Okay, we do better art or we do better. We, we are able to feel the music better or we're able to know what, is, what justice is, is better. And, and that's the bias because we're, we're putting some uh, characteristics that only we have as human beings and, and, and saying that the computer has to replicate those traditions and it's not able to do that. It, just in the same way that we're saying, okay, uh, we have bias within the, the, the human species that uh, they were, were, were replicating. We also have some bias uh, towards the computer saying that the computer is a lower form of cognitive uh, performer until it reaches some characteristics that only humans have. And until then, it will not be intelligent. Well, that's a bias because we are, we're raising the bar to some levels that maybe computers will never be able to do. And we're, we're 
we're asking them to perform some activities that are biological, for example, and not cognitive. So let's separate cognitive from biological if we want to discuss what is, what is cognition, what is intelligence, and what are the activities that are performed by, by machines. So you see that uh, I think we have uh, the, the sum of this, uh, of this uh, thinking is that there is some cleaning we have to do in the semantics on, on the field if we want to talk to each other and define things better. Uh, in order to advance on this uh, attributive, attributive uh, characteristics for, for computers or for uh, artificial intelligence. I, I don't know if I simplified or, <laughs> or made it more complex, the, 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 the discussion, but I, I do believe that the, 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 there, are some, there is some uh, semantic work we, we still have to do here. Uh, Nicholas. Hey, Guy. Uh... I have a question if you, uh, how I'm going to put the question is like this, like all of, uh, many of this, like, uh, cre like, as you said, like, ah, the, 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 the model found a solution that the, that the researchers, the, the controllers didn't expect. Okay. And I, I was wondering like, if, because like, and you say like, no, that's creativity. And like, to me, which like coming for a more technical background that I would say, no, that's brute force search. That's just brute force. The, like the, the, the model is just like searching the, the space states of possibilities and like, and maximizing the optimal solution. We not always know the optimal solution and the optimal solution can sometimes surprise us. And there are many examples of that in the literature. But like, where, and I understand why some people like say, well, oh, but that's not creativity because like uh, the way human beings do creative work is not through brute force search. Like when I trying to like write a paper or like, or write a poem, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not like a monkey typing all the, the possible words into like, ah, this one is nice. Like, I'm not doing brute force search. I'm not just like randomly walking the search space until I find something that I find interesting. Like uh, there are a bunch of inductive prior, uh, priors like guiding my behavior, like a bunch of them. And many of these models, like especially like there's like there, there's a whole literature about the creativity of 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 AI, especially focus on, uh, on genetic algorithms, like if, uh, the, the evolutionary approach to brute force search. And like these systems, they do come up with solutions when you look up to my God, that's wonderful. But it's like, it's the product of random walking and brute force search. And I don't, and like I, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here because like I'm a big supporter. Like I'm all in for AI. This is what I do. But I, uh, as you said, I do believe there's a bunch of uh, conceptual misconceptions, you know, like the um, ambiguous definitions that are used left and right. And people sometimes they don't know like uh, what is the, what is the actual workings of what is going on here? Because like it's you, you can see like a system like AlphaGo, like trying AlphaGo does not do, like AlphaGo has like it's pretty it's it's pretty intelligent. <laughs> it's it's not it's not just doing brute force search. One of its steps is doing brute force search, and the other step it's learning from the search the best movements. So like it's it, it's intricate. It's not just it's not just random walking. Like most of these systems are doing just that. They are just brute forcing the problem. So I think like maybe there's a problem there because like the way we understand like human creativity, like humans do not do brute force search. Like we don't have the cognitive capability of doing that. Like we need a lot of inductive priors like to help us guide us on solving a problem. Most of those priors are unknown. We don't know how to formalize them in a mathematical way. Because if we knew, like, then we could program them in machine learning systems. And 
many machine learning systems would like would gain so much efficiency and power if we had the the right priors like if we knew the like the the one true prior to rule them all but like we don't and probably doesn't isn't one there's a bunch of them that we need to figure it out so to me there seems like to be some kind of difference the way these systems are doing like creative work and the way we do creative work and they're like ah oh, do we need to invent another word like i don't like this approach like i don't like el uh, eliminativism like eliminate words from the vocabulary of other areas like it, it, you're gonna see in many few like especially in philosophy you see everyone all the time appropriating terminologies from other fields like physics like the philosophers love to appropriate like terms from physicists like superpositions and stuff like that and physicists love to appropriate uh uh words from other vocabularies and and, and everyone do, does that and i don't and i don't see the problem but i i do think they are different i do think they are different but like as you said uh I believe like the, the field of AI, we are not trying to build a person like to, <laughs> we are not we're, like AI research don't want to build people like if you want to make a people, you, everyone know how to make a people, you just have to find someone and like, you know, the rest. But, like what we want to do is like to be able to create systems that like can simulate certain types of cognitive tasks and solve interesting problem problems for us so like we don't have to do much of the tedious work that we have to do today so like can these systems like find good solutions and solutions we didn't expect yeah like of course i believe that is that creativity depends on how you define creativity i don't think human creativity is it's perhaps a little bit of brute force search when i'm trying to solve a problem i usually like try a bunch of stuff and I see what works, but I'm not brute forcing. I'm not like this trenching the, the search space. So I, I, I wanted to know your opinion and like, if this distinction makes sense, if it like, it makes sense, like to like, to make a separation, uh, uh, to make a difference, like, oh no, like systems that are uh, finding solutions to brute force search and simple inductive priors are, some form of creativity humans do their search to the like the problem space or like uh, the solution space actually in a different way and like how good you do your search is what we call like creative like do you think that makes sense divide these two or does it make sense because to me it makes but like I don't know, like, uh, I'm agnostic, you know, like, I'm open to, to other interpretations. So that is my question. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I, to give you a short answer on the on the question, because I mean, that's, uh, I also don't have a proposal <laughs> for, for this. But to give a short answer, I would say that we should take a look at the concepts and revise um, vocab regarding separating uh, human activities and, and, and non-human activities well, from the moment when it starts to become a problem. If we have a problem in terms of um, defining something in the field or it's giving us a, 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 a problem in terms of how, how do we approach the concept, then maybe we need a new concept because we're not having, we're, we're not advancing on the, uh, on the uh, on the concept, in terms of um, uh, the discussion, for example, we can say that an airplane flies, uh, a bird flies, uh, and if a fish swims, we don't say that a boat swims or a submarine swims. Uh, but a boat knows how to swim. No, it doesn't know how a boat doesn't know how to swim. Uh, it's a, something different. Uh, a submarine doesn't know how to dive or how to swim although we use the word dive for submarines but we don't always really swim uh, um so uh, what we're saying here is that uh, there is some point where we might need something different uh if if what we want to say is not exactly what we what we are expecting the the, the concept to express um so uh, uh, for example in the, in the ai field of course the 
for philosophy, what we're seeing here uh, is that the main discussion in, the, in, in philosophy is that AI is helping a lot uh, for us. The study of AI is helping to learn something about human cognitivity. Um, so AI is a field that helps us to understand better the human. That, that, that's something that's being said by many uh, even Mar Margaret Borden's research is all about that. She says, oh, the, my interest in AI is because it helps me understand humans better. And then the rest, if AI is able to be creative or not, I don't care. I mean, that, that's a whole different discussion uh, because my point here is that I want to understand humans better. That's fine. So maybe that's why the words we're using, creativity, intelligence, all those, those words are, are, are there because they are helping us with our main focus at this moment, which is humans. Um, from the moment we, we're going to start to analyze something else in more depth, and then we, we say, OK, let's, let's understand this new type of cognition that's not about biological cognition. Then. We're, then when this field develops more and not only because it's helping us understand humans, maybe a, a whole new set of vocabulary uh, things here will need to be uh, created. It not, it's just for pragmatic purposes because we need to, to talk with each other in the field, knowing what we are talking about, even if, it, of course, the concepts, have, they have this, the, 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 the semantic field, right? So, so everything has a semantic field. Of, of some, some people defend that the meaning is more towards this way, the other way. I mean, you 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 navigate you know, inside the semantic field of a word. My concept of intelligence is a little bit different from yours. But if my concept of uh, machine intelligence is uh, at least something more similar to a, another concept of machine intelligence, then we might need some word for that. That's that's I mean how I how I see this. This necessity being being filled uh, when we when we have to jump away from the from the comparison. Right now we're you're using too much. We are all using too much analogy with human activities or cognition activities because we maybe we are too much focused on the human uh, and we are using AI to learn more about ourselves and see what are uh, the limitations that we have and the lim and, and what uh, machines can help us and we're not really focused on on our, our subject of study maybe is too much uh, mixed with our with uh, <laughs> with the other subject of study, which is uh, uh, biological cognition uh, so that's how I I, I, I see the the vocabulary problem a little bit Ev, please go ahead. All right. Um, so I'm just in relating to the, the, the last question that I was asked. My, my question now is, don't we think that the whole problem that we are facing between this, the language problems and um, the vocabulary problems is as a result of what I'd like to call human centricism? So like, let us say, let us go back to the whole concept of Eurocentricism, um, Europe and then the rest of the world. And then now it is humans and then machine. And currently with the whole, um, the way we are trying to, to mold artificial intelligence, we molding them to, to be like humans. So we're doing everything necessary possible to make sure that machines look like humans. And we try to attribute the whole thing about consciousness to machine. And currently we are even trying to attribute personhood to machine. And uh, we want to say that the concept of personhood is that um, from a Eurocentric approach, it has to be rational, it has to be conscious, it has to gain this whole business of free will. And then from an African perspective, from a, a sub-Saharan Afro-communitarian ethical perspective, we want to say that um, uh, uh, machines have to be, especially AI, has to be social, and it has to have the capacity to live in community and all of those. So now we are trying to um, we are trying to attribute full personhood to AI, and because we are trying to attribute personhood to AI, then we are trying to make sure that we bend AI to look like persons, and if they don't meet up to that perception, 
that conception of personhood, then we problematize AI. And then we start saying that, okay, um, AI is not creative. AI is not B, A, B, C, and T. But those problems are as a result of we attributing personhood to AI. And it is we trying to bring this centricism, this human centeredness, because we believe that humans are here and then the rest of other things are here. Animals are here and everything. Like, I mean, if you go back to Aristotle now, for instance, where Aristotle says something like the human soul that is rational, we have the animal soul, and then we have plant soul. So already he has put the humans here. So as a result of that, even with our approach to AI now, we are here and we want AI to be, to be here. Uh, and even if AI tries to prove, gives us a different dynamics of, of, of knowledge production, we don't see that as, um, as really good because it does not fit into that human cognitive or that human perception of, of knowledge or human perception of doing things. Don't you think that that is where the problem is currently? Uh, uh, I, let me see if it, I agree with you, Ed, because uh, th that's what I call that we say uh, when I said, are we testing for language capacity or are we testing for humanity? Are we testing for, for uh, vehicle autonomy or are we testing for a full moral person? Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, there's a, this uh, huge discussion in the in the law field uh, related to the robotic personhood, which is to attribute it, when you attribute personhood, legal personhood to, to a robot. Why? At, at first it seems strange, but we've done that before. We've done that before when we attribute personhood to companies. For example, a company is not a human and a company is able to uh, do contracts, a company purchases, a company uh, buys, sells, uh, commit crimes and, and uh, uh, environmental crimes. Um, so uh, when we when we did that in the past and we we created this uh, legal fiction that is uh, personhood for companies, uh, we we already actually made a step towards being able to recognize other entities as uh, pragmatically some some entities that we deal with in the day to day world without necessarily recognizing its humanity. We don't say that a company is human or has, although we say this, this strategy is very, uh, Coca-Cola strategy is very intelligent. Disney just released a movie. Disney is very smart because it works, uh, knows where to do. So uh, we also attributed intentional states to some entities that have legal personhood, but they are not human. And I think there's just one more I think there, there, there's, there's not even just one more step to, for us to do that uh, uh, to robots, especially for the, 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 the discussion on the car autonomy, the self-driven cars. So the self-driven car, what's the problem with the self-driven cars? You have a, a machine learning system there that doesn't have anything to do more with the, uh, with the maker. So the automaker says, oh, I don't have any responsibility for how my self-driving car is driving because the program that I put there is not the program that is there anymore because the machine learning uh, process is exactly the uh, algorithm being able to change itself. And, and that, but that's the company saying. So I'm at first I'm on the, uh, saying what the company speech is. Uh, so, and I'm telling you more, the car is only driving this way because the owner of the car, the person who bought the car and is using it, um, it, it's indicating where it wants to go, when, and then it has much more influence than me, the automaker. So the automaker is wanting to get rid of the, of the robotic personhood of the car. Uh, but then on, on the same, on, on the other side, the person who is using the car says, no, I don't have any responsibility for how my self-driving car is driving because it's a self-driving car. Uh, so who who stays with the responsibility if the car uh, kills someone? Uh, it's going to be the company, the automaker, or the person who is driving the car. A little bit for everyone, 
uh, we're going to trace uh, but what, what we see in, in law, for example, is that we just have to arbitrarily define someone. Because if we don't arbitrarily define someone, so it's going to be the automaker point. If we don't arbitrarily de define someone, there's not going to be someone watching it. And the whole problem with uh, legal responsibility is who is responsible for some, some action uh, in, uh, in legal terms. You have to arbitrarily define because then otherwise it becomes the, the dog who doesn't have an owner and, you know, or, or the dog that has two owners dies of hunger. Uh, what happens is that uh, uh, we are, so I'm, I'm saying this whole talk about the, the, the self-driven cars uh, uh, tort law issue because we have done that before. We have, we have uh, attributed legal, uh, we have attributed legal personhood, but we also have attributed uh, some human characteristics to a legal entity that is not human. Uh, maybe with robots. So the European Union has a project where it defines uh, robotic personhood already. So it is underway. And it's all because we have to, to establish pragmatic ways of uh, interacting with, with autonomous robots. Uh, but if we're going to look look at these robots as uh, possessing human, some human essential characteristics or not, of course, we're not going to think they are humans. But uh, it's uh, maybe for, for our way of thinking, for the human way of thinking, is very hard to not attribute intentional states to things, just as before, we said that the clouds, uh, the, the, the the clouds are actually gods who who are you know who are who are sending us a, a, a storm because they wanted to cause us some harm or something like that. So, but I'm, I'm pushing here too 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 far on the on the mythological side. But maybe what we're doing is that that just is another example of the way humans think, which is we cannot. We're not. To, it's very hard for us humans to look at other things and do not attribute it, uh, intentional states if those things are moving or acting or doing things. Uh, we we we're very we're very poor on understanding uh, movements without intentional states uh, behind those movements, and that's maybe one of the things we humans need to free ourselves from. Uh, and maybe we. This whole discussion on, on on searching for the essence and say, oh, the robot's here, or uh, the human is here, but we want to bring it up to this is just because we think that the, the intentional states are there uh, in in the in the robot for them to be able to to go up the the the, the stairs and and reach the level that we are. But maybe we we it's just a, a flawed way of thinking about things that move and, and attribute them intentional states. Uh, thanks, Guilherme. I would like also to make some comments. Uh, the first one is that I'm not, uh, I'm def definitely not a gamer. I haven't played a game besides uh, chess for a very, very long time. But I think 300 games to reach that kind of strategy in a game like Arkanoid or something like that, it's a bit uh, um, too much. Uh, I think uh, some, anyone who played Arkanoid uh, uh, reaches that kind of strategy uh, sooner than that. Uh, uh, um, even if, as myself, is not able to, it does not have the dexterity to execute it uh, proficiently. Um, the other thing I want to, I want to, I would like to, in, in that, that uh, uh, I, I think um, points to something that uh, uh, is some, sometimes is, uh, uh, constitutes an, an overwhelming environment surround, surrounding these kinds of things, that uh, our kind of fascination for, for gadgets and uh, and machines and things like that. So I would like to ask, uh, uh, or to, to my comments are, are, are uh, regarding this 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 issue. Uh, who is uh, actually uh, uh, trying to discuss create creativity uh, regarding AI? What is the purpose? 
that's 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 one of my my uh, questions because uh, our discussion has been uh, is, is around is is been has been organized uh, around the idea that uh, humans want AI to be something that it cannot be. Humans project some some kind of qualities or properties towards a, AI and want it to be like this or like that. First of all, I don't think it's humans. I think it's a, a, a very specific uh, uh, group of humans uh, because not everybody agrees with that. Uh, yeah, I, for myself, for instance, I, I, I don't agree with that. I think that we have to treat AI as a machine, obviously, it is a, a, a very particular kind of machine, but I don't think that we have to, to discuss other than in uh, theoretical, uh, uh, with theoretical intent, purely theoretical intentions, something like its creative, creativity, unless there is something else besides that or behind that. And what I'm trying to read, uh, to, to talk about here is precisely that, that, we, that um, legal aspect and social aspect that, that you mentioned, Guilherme, because that's the issue. I mean, when somebody says that a machine is able to create something by itself, what is, was it, what, what is that person saying? It's saying that it is free. It has free, some kind of free will. And it is free to create something out of not out of nothing, but at least out of something else, something that was um, unprecedented. So uh, that's the issue for me, because when we are when we start discussing creativity and freedom and personhood uh, regarding machines, we are actually discussing liability issues, responsibility issues, accountability issues, and and uh, everything that that. Uh, uh, derives from that. I, I, I would like also to, to and therefore it's, it's an important issue, but it's, it's also important to know what we are arguing about. We are, we are not arguing about creativity in machines. We are also arguing about creativity in machines, but we're not only arguing about that. Uh, and and uh, another, another thing that, that is, um, uh, confounding to me is that we are attributing biases to humans on the basis of some, something that is open. Because if we don't know what creativity is, if we don't know what intelligence is, if we are discussing its definition, then we are we are we, we cannot be biased. Neither on for this or that side, we are open. We are discussing it. So I don't I don't want to say that only humans are creative, I don't know. Therefore, the, the, um, the, burden, of, uh, it, that's, the, the burden of proof uh, has to come not from those who think that humans are the only creative beings, because that's established at least, not that they are the only creative, creative beings, but they are, that they are creative beings uh, to, uh, to some extent, but if we are opening uh, that uh, bridge to something else, then the burden of proof has, has to come from those who want to, 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 to state that AI is created, if that's an issue, because I don't think it is, at least not for now. Uh, and and, and the, the, that, that talk about biases and, and uh, the talk about the burden of, of proof uh, as if Humans were at fault for something. I don't think that's that's good enough as a as a, start, as a, a starting point for discussion, because we are already taking taking a position in a discussion which seems to be open regarding a subject that seems to be open. And I, I remind you that Kant, uh, in his uh, what he said about about judgment and art and learning and and, and all those things, is that. Um, uh, there is a difference between ju between judging from uh, uh, given norms, given rules, and uh, judging according to unprecedented uh, uh, happenings, events, and therefore we maybe we are uh, before 
uh, an unprecedented event. So we have to be open to judge, uh, of course, with relation with some given rules, but uh, um, open to, to judge um, something that is utterly new and unprecedented. So that's the, my, my issue, with, my question would be uh, this, who is pushing the AI creativity agenda uh, and uh, why? Thank you, Pierre. Can I add something yeah. to like the, Go ahead. can I, because like I, I, I totally agree with Professor Nuno, like I had, I, like what he said, like it, it's not like humans, like who see themselves, like who project themselves in machines, that like, there's a specific set of people who do this, like uh, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And also like how he pointed, like uh, it, it, it took like 300, like, uh, 300 episodes for that agent like to learn to play Atari and to that environment and like I don't think that's correct like I read the paper of agent 57 and like I think it was like for him to learn to play the 57 benchmark which is the the benchmark for Atari which is the 57 games Atari has it took millions and millions of episodes like this is one of the problems of reinforcement learning. Like reinforcement learning is the most general approach we have to AI, but it's completely sample inefficient. Like we have total sample inefficiency. Like we can't get the thing to work unless like we have millions and millions and millions of episodes. And like Professor Nuno said, like I played Atari when I was a kid and like I didn't need like 300 like episodes like to, to play the thing. So like, again, saying like, we are not doing brute force search. We're doing something so much more elaborate than that. Like, we don't know what that is. So, and I'm also interested in understanding, like, like what is the agenda? Like, like saying, like, oh, like defending that machines have creativity. I'm with Professor Nuno. I don't know. Like, creativity is not a well-defined subject to me. But a very interesting question is, like, what is this narrative? Like, the narrative that, like, ah, AIs can have creativity. Like, like, what are the motivations of this narrative? Like, and what are the intentions behind the people who push this narrative forward? I think that is a great answer. A great answer, no, a great question. Thank you uh, for a question. A, a great question for which, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the answer to, uh, to about the the drivers of the agenda. But I can uh, what, what I what I can suspect is that we have, of course, uh, two two different issues here that we would have to to separate. Uh, one is um, one is the the division in society regarding the agenda. So, of course, when I was talking at the beginning of the presentation, I said I'm very interesting about the. Uh, the narrative or the speech of those who say this will never could never be delegated to a machine um, to understand if the argument comes from comes from a, a conclusion on an essentialist analysis that says okay we cannot uh, cannot reach those types of characteristics and we cannot we will never be able to uh, artificial intelligence will never be able to have those type of essential characteristics and that's different from uh, I'm afraid to be replaced by a machine uh, type of argument where I say, no, 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 I can do it better. Why? Because, because I'm afraid to be replaced by a machine, I'm going to say that the machine can never do something as great as I do. Why? Because there's an essential component here on the output. Uh, uh, in, inside the output, there's a component that comes from an essential characteristic that only humans can have. Uh, but then you can say, well, but that's the same output. I mean, the self-driving car is driving itself. Uh, no, but it, it doesn't, it's, it, it's not conscious that it's driving in this beautiful countryside and it cannot uh, know how, it doesn't have an intention. It's just obeying a, a line of commands. And then it doesn't say that it's driving to get to your grandmother's house and then you're going to have a beautiful lunch and then that it's motivated. It's not motivated by by this, this type of driving. So... Uh, let's separate this discussion because there's the, the there's a, a a pragmatic side on the day-to-day -day attribution of uh, legal personhood that I think has nothing to do with a search for an essentialist 
characteristic on the on the intention or, or the mental states of some uh, machine cognitive performed activity. Uh, so uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that, for example, philosophy, uh, we, we're here, uh, 3,000, 3, 4,000 years of philosophy. I don't know how, how many years. Philosophy doesn't have an agreement on, on what free will is. Uh, what is free will? I don't know. There's, there's, I mean, I know that there's many different uh, 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 philosophers defending that even free will exists or doesn't even exist. And, 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 and among those who defend that free will exists, there's different concepts of how it how it happens and and what it is uh but on the on the other side which is the pragmatic uh side of uh, on the legal side because we're, we're dealing here with, we're we're putting against each other philosophy and law right so a law, of course it, it draws some principles from uh philosophy but it also has to do with the fact that self-driving cars are driving on the road so uh, until am i able to philosophically define if that self-driving car that's driving on the road has free will or not, I have to find a solution to attribute responsibility to it without entering the discussion if it's a moral agent or not. Because the discussion that is a moral agent or not will not be solved by the time uh, the, the, the responsibility is uh, already uh, on the, happening on the road. So that that's that's one of the problems I think that the uh, the the discussion on the the moral agent concept it can't be together with the 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 legal one in terms of let's try to find a common ground until we move on because things are moving on without us uh, finding a common ground for three thousand years in philosophy uh, and, and and that's what I. Uh, but that you can say, ah, oh, but that's a very non-philosophical uh, standpoint, right? You're, you're, you sound more like an economist than than a, than a philosopher. But 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 I mean, this, this is the the way the way that I look at the problem is that I we, we, we do need to separate the 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 discussion in terms of uh, of how we deal with it. Please go ahead, professor. Just to just to clarify, so you think that. Uh... Autonomous cars should be should be circulating in, in the streets before any kind of regulation is in place, and then no, and no. afterwards we 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 deal with it with, with it in the courts arbitrarily. No, 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 no. I uh, I said that uh, self-driving cars must be on the roads before we have an agreement if they are moral agents or not. Uh, they will no, be. That, that's that's not the issue. Be, yeah. The no. issue is. Who is the moral agent now? Because moral agents can, we can reach an agreement regarding who is a moral agent afterwards and change the regulation. But if we have self-driving cars now, we have to, to, to reach an agreement regarding who is the moral agent now. And now, I think, uh, all, uh, all our knowledge points to the fact that those who build the machines are the moral agents because the machines are not moral agents. Yeah, my, my, my opinion I... is that we, we, we have to define the responsibility without defining who is the who the moral agent is. Because it's, a, it's arbitrarily law will have to define responsibility. So it's the car maker, okay, point. But is the car maker the moral agent? I don't know, it's just arbitrarily I define. So what I'm saying is yes, yeah, we, we, we have to have regulation, obviously, but the regulation will come before the discussion on the moral agency is done. Because I don't think that discussion is going to be done uh, really soon. Because I've I've, I've seen you know the moral agents we enter on the free will discussion, autonomy, and then we're going to be tangled, uh, just like Rapunzel is tangled on her hair. We're going to be tangled on the on. I'm very Disney today, right? Uh, Sorry, we're going to be tangled Disney. on the on the issue because we're going to we're going to be uh, adding some elements in the on the discussion. But yeah, then, we, but, either we draw the line here up high and, and, and let the rest happen uh, down here, or we're going we're gonna to never get out of, of the discussion of uh, moral but, agency. But uh, however it may be, the decision is not arbitrary. Because we have, we have as, well, different communities, 
have uh, well established established uh, uh, rules and laws. Uh, then every every decision uh, regarding who is uh, liable or who is, who is accountable regarding those those kinds of things is not arbitrary. It's based on law on the law on existing law. But the law is not like uh, it's not like uh, Moses tablets. It's not written in stone. We can always change it. Sure, sure. Now, what I call arbitrary is not the same as authoritarian. What I call arbitrary is that, uh, uh, for example, in Brazil, we can say the car maker is responsible. And in the United States, we can say the driver is responsible. What I call arbitrary is that that would be a decision of the society. And whatever comes up on the vote, you know, so Congress is going to vote on who is responsible for paying the damages if the self-driving car kills someone. U.S. votes for the driver. Brazil for, votes for the car maker. Well, that, that's very, very common. By the way, that's, that's, that's very common. Also. But that's not arbitrary, okay. and that's not that that's not that simple because you, we have a constitution. And the constitution uh, uh, has, establishes some some kind of limitations to 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 that kind of proceedings. So, when, however it might be, it's not arbitrary, and it, 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 however it might, it might, uh, what whatever the result uh, will be, it's not arbitrary. It is within the limitations established, established uh, legally established by a given a given community. Yeah. No, I just meant that that we, we could have different outcomes depending on the country. For example, it, well, that, but, that's record, yeah. But different sure. countries have different policies of immigration, for instance. Sure, sure. Uh, and different policies for immigration regarding the what, the, the country you come from. Uh, uh, I had no problem uh, coming to Brazil, but I, I think that Ed might have more problems than I did. So uh, those things are are the law. The law the law works like that. It's sure, not sure. Yes. I think. It's no, I agree. I agree, I agree with that point. Yes, I agree with it. Nicholas, are, do you still have your hands raised? Yeah. Oh, okay. no, I wanted to make like as soon as I heard Professor Nuno and I asked the same question, like already, like the some possible answer just already come up in my head because like I think the answer is kind of obvious. Uh, like I agree with Professor Nuno that like there are intentions behind a lot of the narratives that we see today like behind ai like i i see a lot of misconceptions like being said even for like top ai researchers like you know like deep mind produces like a model and when like when they're going to uh, advertise the model like the headline they use the clickbait is completely like misleading like it, it, it it's false like they are like they are looking for clicks they are looking for like uh uh, for investments and stuff like that and a lot of like uh nowadays like one of the big reasons like like that that we are going through a an ai spring like we're gonna we're, we're having like all of these breakthroughs and everyone think that we're gonna have full agi next year is because like we have a lot of investment like we never had like the field never had so much money flowing into it like we have nowadays like we have so much investment so much and there's a lot of fear that like there we're gonna have a winter like uh, ai research has like winters and springs and they alternate and we had an ai winter in the 80s and the 90s and we've been living a spring since the 2000s and like there's a fear that like the spring is gonna die soon so uh I think that a lot of like the way that like the the AI con community presents itself, like when it presents its results or when it presents like uh, even our terminologies, like what like I think neural networks are, are one of most of the misleading names of the whole world. Like uh, once I I had a lecture with a professor and he says and he said like. Uh, I understand why neural networks are called neural networks, like Frank Hosenblatt uh called them that way with his knowledge about neuroscience from the 50s which was almost nothing and but like if we're gonna say what neural network do what they really do they are machines for feeding squiggly lines into data 
And that's what they do. <laughs> they are an equation to fit squiggly lines into data. And that's all there is. But if we call them like uh, machines for fitting squiggly, squiggly lines into data, we're not going to have like the media hype and like neural networks, like we are emulating the human brain. And we're not, like we're not emulating the human brain. They are vaguely uh, inspired in an architecture like there is the, that has... Nowadays, we know that the brain is not like that anymore. It's much more complicated. So I think that my point is that the, the AI community itself is responsible for like much of the ambiguous terms that we have, like the way like we present ourselves when we're going to write an article or we're going to write a, a news to go on the journals. So that like we keep getting the sweet, sweet money funding that we need, you know, and, and, and like, like, oh, I don't know what to think about that because like, yeah, like, like people who work with this, like they have like intentions, like, yeah, I want to keep getting funding and money for my research. Like people, for, for example, like people who do deep learning, do deep learning research, like in our honest researchers, like one of my favorite is Francois Cholet from France. And like, he is the creator of the Keras library, which is a library like me and everyone who does deep learning uses. Like he, like one of his books, his textbooks, look, which is a te like, it, it's the Bible of the subject. Like we already know all of, like the, the limitations of deep learning and we will not be able to get AGI from that. Like it's just not possible. Like we cannot get extrapolation from interpolation of data. We, we, we won't get extrapolation of data from simple matrix multiplication. We won't get, it's not what deep neural networks do and they will never do. We're gonna need something else, but we still keep pushing the narrative that deep learning is the thing that is going to take us to AGI. And that's not true. But like some people, and, but, but some people like say it is, then they, 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 they don't, I don't think they speak from a, a place of deceptiveness. Sometimes it's a place of ignorance. They just don't understand the fundamentals of the, the theory in itself. But I think like there's a lot of, of narratives and discourse which is based on like let's keep getting money for our field so we can keep doing our work even if we have no clue how we're going to deliver like the, the the promise of human like intelligence and, i don't and, know and, like... yeah, nicholas let me just interrupt you because there's there's lots of uh so the of course these interests are not we can't assume that they're all aligned right the problem yeah. is that, for example, even even for example, when we I, I agree with Professor Nun. I mean, the, the, in terms of the the cap, what's the capitalist uh, agenda? The capitalist agenda is to make money. So we say, okay, what's the what's Facebook's agenda? Is Facebook's agenda uh, connect people? No, we're seeing that the the whole Facebook uh, issue here, now, uh, the, the the whistleblower that's. Uh, uh, Doing all these statements, is that why? Because the, the the agenda is to make money, and of course the agenda is to make money. It doesn't mean that the uh, Mark Zuckerberg and 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 the guys from Google uh, they all sit in a room and get together once a week because in a secret room where they define what's going to be the future of of uh, <laughs> you know or, or, or the the field. Because there is lots of also the, of conflict interests. For example, right now Apple is having a huge issue with Facebook because Apple changed the privacy settings on the on the devices, which it messed up all the the Instagram and Facebook algorithms. And and, and why? But there's a, a it's a, a battle that's happening in the field between giants, of course. But I mean, it doesn't mean that they are aligned to build this imagined future of uh, AI. And and the uh, the other thing we can say regarding the expression AI field, who is the AI field? In the AI field, we have uh, Elon Musk doing the implants in the brain. But in the AI field, we also have Carissa Velis, for example, in Oxford defending uh, privacy, which is, I mean, they are all AI field. I mean, and, and that doesn't mean that the AI field gets together 
in, in Davos once a year to, to I wouldn't put yeah. Musk on the AI field. <laughs> uh, guy is not in the field. No, but, but the, the, the field the field is whoever controlling also the money on the field. So I mean, so who ah, is? Shit, then uh, you're right. And, and, and also there's there's also the um, the marketing side on the thing, which is a lot of people. We were saying that a lot of people talk about AI. They don't have an idea what they're doing. A lot of people use AI with uh, knowing that they have nothing to do with AI. For example, ah, oh, this banana was produced with AI in a farm where the AI defines where the banana should be picked up. Uh, and it has nothing to do with AI, but people use marketing. Today, everything has AI, right? My coffee has AI. It was produced with a, uh, but it doesn't because, uh, why? Because people use the wording uh, sometimes just for marketing uh, purposes. And it, it's not even in the field of uh, AI. So all of these things uh, put together, we can uh, what the, the 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 rest of this uh, of this field is that we can understand that there's no 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 aligned necessary aligned uh, direction in the in the people who are members of, of the field and there's no aligned agenda. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on on an aligned agenda in terms of everyone who is participating on like the big techs are aligned. I don't think so. I think they are. They have a, a, a common purpose, all of them, which is to make money, which which are the reason why they 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 were created and they 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 survive. But I also think that they the the in between the these giant texts, we also have some some conflicts that not necessarily uh, people sitting in a room thinking about how we can explore more the rest of it. Uh, so just to, to 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 pinpoint one one aspect of a non a non homogeneity oh, oh, oh. in the oh, field. Yeah, it's also a bit ingenuous, no? Sorry, I, I that, should speak in but, English. I, yeah, I think yeah. that's that's a bit but, a but bit that, 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 but because I, because yeah. we don't need they don't need to be aligned. I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, so that's not the issue here. But uh, <laughs> uh, what what I'm saying is that is that we have to be as careful to, regarding these these issues as we are regarding uh, uh, other issues of our time. And, and we, we, there, there are plenty of platforms where uh, different uh, interests and even conflicting interests uh, are, uh, you, we have now one at COP26 uh, where many conflicting interests are present and they, they all su subscribe an agenda. So we don't need to, to have a, uh, not, we don't even need to have a, a a stated agenda to know what that is. I don't think that Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola have, have the same interests, but they all are interested in selling in selling uh, sh sugar. No, I, I agree with you, Professor. So, I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not saying that there, that there's no that there, there's no common uh, objectives in the in the in the field. I'm just saying that I wouldn't bet on a complete alignment in terms of a, a preset. Uh, agenda where everyone has consensus all the time. I don't think there's a, 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 a consensus agenda in between everyone that participates in the in the field. That's what I'm uh, just the, the only thing that I'm saying. Colleagues, I think we've run out of time. So once again, thank you, Nuno. Thank you. Guilherme for this brilliant presentation and very, very interesting uh, discussion. I don't think we're going to exhaust all these uh, problems and solve all the problems of humanity and AI overall. But uh, this, this has been a, a fascinating discussion. And, uh, of course, we're going to resume next uh, Tuesday. We still have a few presentations. Uh, uh, I would say that, Ed, if, if you want to join us for the uh, following meetings, you should feel free to do so. And if you want to make a presentation yourself, we still have available the last meeting. Uh, we can double check this with you and, and get back to you to see if, if you want to make a presentation. But Guilherme, thank you so much. It was excellent. Thank you, have man. a nice week, thank you everyone. So much. See you Bye. Tuesday. Take care. Ô, professor Itamar.
Ops, ok. Yeah. Tu, quer eu te, tu quer que eu te passe o e-mail do Edmund? Para tu convidar ele para. Ele já passou, ele já passou, eu já ah, acho que tá. ele... Obrigado. Chile. Tá. Ô, Thank professor, you, nossa reunião hoje é 5 e 10 tá tranquilo, professor? Tranquilo. Tá bom, então. Então nos vemos lá, professor. Tamo juntos. Um abraço, tudo de bom. Boa semana. Boa semana. See you guys, take care.